All right, good evening. Welcome everybody. This is a regularly scheduled city council workshop. Today is Monday, March 25th. Around the table, we have Councilor Leonard, Councilor Tremble, Councilor Schaefer, Councilor Yakbaga, myself, Councilor Chair Pelletier, Councilor Dean, Councilor Fish, and Councilor Fournier. We are also joined by City Manager Deb Lorry. And first thing on the agenda tonight is the CDC approved mobile service program sites. Sure, thank you. Uh, so around the 1st of March, um, staff, the city did receive notice from the CDC um, that there had been a mobile syringe service provider approved to operate in our community um, through outreach locations. Obviously, mobile means mobile. We have fixed syringe service providers in our community um, through two other um, organizations. Um, the locations that were approved were the intersection of Texas Avenue and University Way. Uh, 100 Broad Street, um, which is Pickering Square, and 125 Harlow Street, which is Pierce Park. Um, that is part of their process is when it is involving public property, is there is no outreach to those of us who own the public property, the city proper. Um, so we did follow up immediately with the CDC and ask, you know, kind of what's the process, what's going on. Uh, we've met a couple of times with them. Um, we really are concerned about um, the concern expressed by other community members about um, services being in public places and public parks. Uh, so we were working with the CDC to try to find alternate locations that are sort of close to and in a private setting, privately owned and operated and not on public park. Um, so Council Chair and I have spent a couple of weeks having these conversations. Um, so um, we really wanted to come. I know a number of members of the community have heard about it and have expressed concern. So really wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity as a body um, to have this conversation because we do continue to have conversations with the CDC on this. And I don't know if you want to add anything to my introduction because I know you sure. sat in on a couple of those meetings. Yeah, I'll be happy to. So when I heard about the permit approval, I was very concerned. We have seen a number of complaints, especially in the last year, around unwanted behaviors in Pierce Park and the impact that it's had on the Bangor Public Library. Um, we know that the library, it, for some people, no longer seems like a safe or welcoming place to go. And you know, the library, Pierce Park, is a drug-free safe zone, which, of course, the law applies to people selling or using drugs. But the whole point of a drug-free safe zone is to prevent children and other people from being exposed to um, drug-related activity. And so to me, it seems uh, personally like the wrong place. Now, I do wanna say that I'm very supportive of harm reduction strategies. I believe the data shows that harm reduction works. I think the city of Bangor in the last year, if you look at some of the ways that we've spent our ARPA dollars, has a track record of supporting harm reduction strategies in our community. But I also think it's, um, within our right as a city and as a city council to determine where we think appropriate locations for that activity to take place are. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that Pierce Park is an appropriate location. I also don't think Pickering Square is an appropriate location for that to happen. Mm -hmm. It is. It backs up to the Children's Museum. It's a place where we're about to renovate public green space. It's the center of our transit hub. It's the first experience that visitors to Bangor have if they um, if they park in the parking garage, it is a major thoroughfare between the waterfront and our downtown businesses. And I think it sets the wrong tone for Bangor if several days a week for multiple hours at a time, we have people handing out needles and other supplies. Um, so I would, my preference, and I'm just sharing you my thoughts so you can know where we've been. And then of course, you're all here to provide your thoughts as well, is that I would like us to work with Needle Point Sanctuary, who's a syringe service provider in question, to find places that feel more appropriate, where they will be less out of the major path of travel for many of our residents and visitors, and, and also provide people with access to the services that they need to stay healthy and out of harm's way. Councillor Trumbull. Well, just on your last point, so we would like to work with them to alter, alternative locations. Is, is, do they interest in working with the city on alternative locations? Because I agree with that. That would make sense. If they... Yes, um, interest has been expressed in working with us to find alternate locations. Uh, we uh, do not have a meeting yet scheduled. We're sort of in a holding pattern for now, but um, I believe that that uh, 
they have expressed that they would be interested in in finding locations that that fit both needs. So right, oh, so, uh, I just had a couple of the comments. So right now, how does this stand? Are we waiting to hear back from the CDC or? So we got an email. It was to I don't know if it came in late Friday or today. Um, looking for us to get together this week because the CDC week. is the is the contract holder, mm -hmm. um, and Needlepoint Sanctuary is the provider. So yeah. the three of us to get together to to talk about. We have some. We have given some suggestions again not at a public property. We're happy to have continued discussions. When we first asked for alternate locations, the alternate proposed was Abbott Square um, and um, a location along the waterfront. Mm -hmm. um, no, I would just agree with the council chair. I mean, we've come quite a ways in Bay. I mean, we've worked with Heal. We have a contract with Heal for needle pickup. So, I mean, it's been a big problem in the city, needles all over the place. So, and I think the one-to-one -one exchange has kind of gone away. Isn't it has. It? You can just needles can be given out without any exchange now so and i appreciate i know that ben's here from the library and appreciate hold his board and it was unanimous that they're unanimously opposed to having that at that location next to the library and i appreciate that they've come a long way they hired a social worker outreach worker to try to help people get resources and they don't see this as particularly helpful to what they're trying to get done at the library so i support the library board's position and i support what we're doing Thank you. Councilor Schaefer? Um, so when I heard about this, I was also troubled by it and shared it. And my almost 18-year-old daughter said, so glad I'm leaving Bangor. Mm -hmm. That same 18-year-old daughter, uh, when she turned seven, was in the paper for raising thousands of dollars for her beloved Bangor Public Library. And one of my goals as a parent was... I want the librarians to know my kids' names. And they did, they knew my kids' names. They have not felt comfortable going to the library for a while. Uh, and it would be very convenient to walk down. They used to walk from my husband's office on Exchange Street and walk down on their own to the library and swap out books. And <laughs> even though they've gotten older, their comfort level has gotten less comfort, comforting there. Uh, I am a huge supporter of harm reduction. I'm on record with testimony supporting safe injection sites that. Other counselors did not agree with, you know, other with some counselors having their name on that. Part of the reason why I support safe injection sites is because it does give more a more controlled and safe environment for people with substance use disorder um, to do that, so that it isn't something that is scaring people away from the library. I know the bathrooms have had to be closed in the library. I know I've, I remember waiting. This is like pre-COVID, and we were sitting there waiting for my kids to have a program. So it would have been 2019 or 2020, and you know, sitting in a side room and saw a couple of people enter a single user bathroom for a long time. Uh, the library is has been an essential part of my life here in Bangor. When I first moved to Bangor, it was actually under construction and it was in what used to be a Martin's out on <laughs> Hilger Street. And there were little baskets all around town that you could put your books in and like at Borders had a library basket to make it easier to deal with books. But that was my first trip to the Bangor Public Library and, and not my last, but I couldn't tell you what my last trip was because we haven't been down there. Uh, and then I look at Pickering Square and we have these beautiful plans for the backyard where same daughter, full disclosure, has worked at the Maine Discovery Museum as a camp counselor. And because she works, she works there because she has loved growing up in the museum as well as the library. Another, I had a membership for years because it was such a great fun place to go when mm -hmm. you got 12 inches of snow and <laughs> couldn't get outside. Both of those locations are child, are very child and family centric locations for sure. What, it, and, and I have heard the argument that you go where people are using to meet the people in need. So what happens if people start using in the Little League fields between Fairmount and 14th Street. Would that then be an approved site? Because, well, there are people here and they need it and we need to provide services to them between in this big backyard between these two elementary schools. And I think that we need to set up some sort of controls to make sure that we do keep our drug-free zones as drug-free as possible. It's certainly not gonna stop it. We know it won't, but I think that we need to work on making sure that we find alternative locations. I support needle exchanges, I support all of that, but it is very disheartening as a city councilor whose 
Same daughter, by the way, is why I'm here. Because she said, you should run. You have good ideas. And now she's very excited to leave Bangor because she feels unsafe in her own hometown. <laughs> uh, so I would support figuring out a solution that does not involve needle exchange at those two locations. Councillor Yakbaga and then Councillor Fish. So with um, for me, with a background in social work, I believe in uh, harm reduction for sure. I mean, we know that it works and we know that it prevents further uh, yeah. further illnesses and, and further uh, virus transmission and stuff. At the same time, at the same time, I think the way that CDC did this, it was it was not right. We were not a part of the discussion. We met with them last year. We had extensive conversations. And I expect, like in those situations, they will reach out to us because this involves Bangor. So we 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 have not heard back from them and un from them until it was done. So I I think they failed uh, on that point. The second one is, I don't think the locations are right at all. I think that those locations have had enough. We it's enough. We we don't want we don't wanna put more pressure on the locations. I think the library, everyone is complaining. We, as we wanna support the population, we wanna make sure that everyone else is heard and everyone else feels safe. We always talk about perception. I know and we'll repeat that at the same time, we have to listen to everyone. It does not sound right. Even the location on Border Street, I, with the recent uh, complaints from the University of Maine at Augusta Bangor campus, I honestly, I don't think that is an option. If we think about it, I support that the city reaches out and suggests other locations. We, we yeah, we want to meet people where they are, absolutely. At the same time, we can't expose children to, to those scenes. We have the library, we have the museum, and... We have students at UMAIN who don't feel safe. So I feel we have to, to work together with CDC. They, for them to come to the table and discuss this clearly with the city of Bangor to find locations that work for, for us as a city and for our population. Why we continue to support the unhoused in our community and those who are struggling with substance use and mental health. Thank you. Councillor Fish. Um, I too um, feel that um, I was very surprised and not happy about this decision without our knowledge. And from my understanding, they were already told when these two locations were mentioned that they would not be uh, locations that the city would want them at. And yet they they got permits from CDC to go to exactly the two locations that we requested them not to go to. So that um, not only concerns me about um, how this happened, but what other nonprofits and are, are working, um, you know, there's a lot of great nonprofits that are working within our city that have been very helpful. And I think they work collaboratively uh, with us and um, let us know what's going on. And, you know, I've heard a few stories in the last two weeks about other situations with some nonprofits. So I don't know how we as a city and a council can get better regulation or better control and demand a little more disclosure and, and especially be part of decisions made um, as, as serious as this. Um, I too want to protect um, the spread of, of hepatitis and HIV. I think clean needles is a very big part of that and harm reduction for not only our vulnerable population, but our first responders. And um, and I don't know that having three mobile sites where they want to go without our knowledge and consent is definitely not something I can agree to. So I don't know what we can do. Maybe we work with our city solicitor and we as a group to come up with some kind of ordinance, uh, a regulation or something that gives us a little more control so this doesn't happen again. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Does that give you direction? Yep. yep, I'll continue to have the conversations uh, with CDC and see if um, some of the alternate locations, keeping in mind, we don't we don't want to create distance as a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, we are mindful of all of those things, but to see if we can um, find a different solution. Chair, can I just pop up something yes. else? Should, should we at the same time be proactive about this, some other group coming forward? I mean, I know we're going to work on these location, but can we pass an ordinance that 
and be more selective? I mean, stating where we don't want yep. these in the city? So when we what we looked at initially was what do we currently have in place? Mm -hmm. And we currently have an event permit policy in place. And in consultation, there he is, in the consultation with the city solicitor, um, operating or creating an event in our public space requires groups to fill out a permit. And we have discretion in granting the permit as to whether or not it is in keeping with the rest of the activities in this in this space. So we believe we would have the opportunity where if the space is not appropriate to go ahead and deny that permit. Um, this group has um, pulled permits occasionally um, and it has never included syringe service or syringe exchange in their description of their of their um, events. So it is certainly one thing that we have, and and I think Dave had some suggestions as to if that's the avenue we want to pursue. Sorry, Dave, the city solicitor, as to some potential small tweaks we'd want to make to that policy. Mm -hmm. I have a question, please. So we supported Hill uh, mm -hmm. with ARPA. So yep. I mean, we already we have already been working on addressing this these yep. issues and working in downtown area. So I so I don't see why why now again in the same areas that we already have you know real working. So I don't understand why again. So I think the distinction is is that these are mobile syringe service programs. So they are going to people. A, a mm -hmm. conventional syringe service program requires individuals to go to them. And going to them is not always as easy for someone. Um, I do think that perhaps that changes. I don't know if anybody had a chance to go to the Heart Open House today. I had it on my calendar, but didn't. Same. So, so, okay. So we all had good intentions. So my understanding is Heal believes that I think they're on track to open. And Josh, if you're listening and you're not really ready to open next week, I'm sorry. But my understanding is, is they are ready to open April 1. And that will provide indoor space. Um, part of that program was acquiring a vehicle so that individuals would, okay. so transportation would not be a barrier. We did, I did share that information. CDC wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. So I shared that with them um, late last week and said, oh, by the way, did you know we did this? And I believe they're on track to open April 1. So I believe April 1, there are some additional alternatives to individuals who are in need of syringe service um, programs. Because it, it's not just an exchange. It's not just syringes. It's testing. It's educational. It's access to services. It's connections. So I I think the timing is yeah. is good for, for what we're doing. And which says there has to be more collaboration between all of these agencies. I mean, we're back to the same exact argument. Mm -hmm. Yep. Other thoughts or questions? Okay, next up is homelessness protocol. Yes. So I think folks remember, um, you may not remember, depends on when you came on. In 2021, the state of Maine adopted uh, a requirement that every law enforcement agency in the state adopt a homelessness crisis protocol. Um, and we had to do that at the direction of the Attorney General, um, Bangor, and I think it wasn't too long ago, BDN did an article on everybody, and I think there were only two that didn't have one, if I recall correctly from Sawyer's article, and Kathleen's looking at me going, I'm not sure. So, <laughs> so I'll just say that, um, so every community has one. Um, they all look virtually the same because we have Mall modeled them off of the same requirement of the AG, which is what we've done. Um, it really didn't alter too much what we were doing. Um, obviously, we have a larger concentration of individuals who are unhoused in our community. Um, so there is sort of a perception that it looks different in Bangor than it does in 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 Orono or Hamden. Um, um, some of that is just related to scales. Um, it does. The policy does allow for law enforcement to use professional judgment. Um, our officers employ this every day. It's done through observations and discussions, and that's a determining factor in, 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 in identifying what our response mm -hmm. will be. 
Um, there was a flyer recently created that states that cops should not arrest you for or give you a citation for any of the listed crimes. The listed crimes were the ones that were identified by the state legislature. That is not true because it is at the discretion and professional judgment of our police officers. I will say when we first talked about this in 2022, um, you know, we were we were really and we remain committed to connecting people to outreach, connecting people to resources, connecting people to a pathway. Um, but I, I, I sense that people don't feel that um, that is enough, um, that perhaps there isn't enough accountability, if you will, occurring within the community. Um, so, you know, the police chief and I had chatted about, you know, we can certainly add some parameters to talk about, you know, if we've talked to you three times, you know, it's not just, a, you know, we're going to go to a citation. It becomes very difficult. Um, you know, we can do citation. We can do criminal trespass orders first. Criminal trespass orders will bar an individual from being in a particular area. Um, the good thing about a criminal trespass order, which kind of, kind of tries to dovetail into this law, is it is, does not become part of your criminal record. So it is not further criminalization. Um we can do that when we go back repeatedly for criminal trespass orders. It's going to have to go to a citation. And a citation is going to likely result in, you know, escalated behavior. People are not happy to get citations, but um, our police officers are well trained to deal with that and we'll deal through that. Um, so we can, you know, he's talked about we're, we're going to talk to the officers about if, if there's a significant history, we're going to escalate. Um, is this going to continue to, um, disrupt public order if, if we don't take additional actions. It becomes difficult for us to, we currently do criminal trespass orders, we currently do citations, and we currently do take individuals to jail. Um, sometimes we're not always able to accommodate. Jail isn't always able to accept somebody, even though we may feel their behavior meets that threshold. Um, for those of you that went on the, the jail tour or who listened to the county commissioner's meetings, Hopefully you understand that Penobscot County, I believe is 2,800 cases deep behind. Uh, they're talking about a three to five year backlog. And there are a significant number of individuals sitting in Penobscot County jail awaiting pre-trial pre -trial, who have likely been waiting there longer than any sentence they would have received. And so it creates this whole backlog. We are not looking to add to the backlog, but we are trying to find the right balance for the community. Questions and comments? Councillor Fish. I think, um, you know, the, the protocol that was, um, I guess each municipality had to come up with a protocol and the state gave us um, suggested guidelines. We had to follow the guidelines. Had yep. to follow the guidelines. But I will tell you that my phone has been blowing up the last three weeks. People are not happy. So I don't know what was going on. I know a lot of things. I know it's very complex, <laughs> and, you know, but at the same time, I think somehow we as a council and as a city need to take a better um, control, take something different because what's happening is not working. Right. People are telling me investors and multi-generational businesses that have been here for generations are seriously considering other alternatives than Bangor. New investors who have invested multi-million dollars because they fell in love with our city. And they tell me today that they still love our city. And we have an opportunity to be a very prosperous, um, vibrant city in the future. But they also feel we're on the threshold that if we don't get a handle on this, it can go in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And some of them have even said that they're going to step back and take a breath to see what we do. So somehow we need to support our police department so that they can uh, enforce the law to, to protect our property and our citizens because they do not feel safe and there is crime and there is an attitude that people can get away with things, whether they have, you know, I trust that our police department knows how to handle. I think mm -hmm. we have a very compassionate and wise, mm -hmm. unexperienced police department. And I trust that they can make decisions, but I also feel they have been handicapped from being able to protect property and the citizens the way they should be as a result of somehow this protocol. So I would like to see it somehow amended so we can support our police department 
um, to, um, you know, doing a better job, doing the jobs that we entrust them to do. So, you know, I, I know you explain and, and mm -hmm. I'm new, so I admit I might not understand, but um, I, I do know as just being a longtime Bengal resident, what we're doing is not working. Okay. And I know it's not just because of this protocol, right. it's a lot of other things, but I also think we have to change something. Yep. Uh, people are upset and we have to change something. And anyway, that's my two cents for tonight. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to, so one of the, one of the, the favorite sayings of, of the police chief, and I think it's one of the favorite sayings of all of us here, you know, that work within the government is, you know, we're here as a reflection of the community. The community wants something different. We can respond to that. Um, but we take our lead from the community. And so if there's a desire you know, for a shift, it's easy enough for us to accomplish that within the existing policies and guidelines that exist. And I think some of it may go to, um, Councillor Schaefer used um, the phrase um, compassion fatigue. And I think this is yet another sign of the compassion fatigue that the community has felt. And we, you know, as long as the council is supportive of that and, you know, really wants to reflect that in their operations, it's easy enough for us to accomplish that. I'm not saying easy enough. It'll be a shift, and that's okay. But we want to be reflective of what our community wants. Councilor Chumbo? Well, I'm, I too want to be reflective of the, the community, and I think that's what we're hearing. I agree with everything Councilor Fish said. I think if the police department needs to hear that this council would like us to be more, I mean, we can't arrest everybody that's doing something. There's not the room in the jails, but whatever they need for to hear from the council that we need to be more aggressive about how we're policing the downtown. I think it's mostly the downtown area, but it's, you know, when somebody in the, a neighborhood on the outskirts of downtown uh, has somebody that's just walking into the street and they call the police department and they show up and take care of the person. And then half an hour later, people show up at the house banging on the windows because they're the ones that called the police on their friend that was walking in the streets. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, trying to plug a, a dike. If you, you take one area and then something else happens. So, I think we're at the tipping point. I think in Bangor, and we need, to, and we we we're here. We're going to be reflective of the city citizens. I mean, unless people have their heads buried in the sand, people have had it, and it's it's about things that you know we talked about the library earlier. People would like to go downtown and take their kids to the library, but if I had kids, I wouldn't be taking the library down. Now, I hate to say that on, in a public meeting, but I think we can change it so people are comfortable coming back downtown. You know, you know, we, we need to let people know that we we want a different atmosphere in Bay. Councillor Yakabaka. So I'm not sure I fully agree with the statements Councillor Fish mentioned or Councillor Trimble. I I I think maybe we can listen to the police department chief and, and like about his opinion on this, because of what I heard when we had those discussions with the folks at University of Maine at Augusta Bangor campus. It was when the deputy chief was there, he said, uh, we are doing our best. At the same time, we don't want to be for every single incident. We are in the face there just, you know, we want to, they wanted to create this trust with the community. They don't want to be just over, like right there with every single incident and, you know, being, being the, like look bad in front of the community. So that I think we should listen to them and to their thoughts on this. I think they are doing their job. They are doing their best, uh, supporting us in the community and supporting, you know, all sides. Maybe it's beneficial to to listen to them. I uh, I think that's how we can decide if if they are doing, you know, what they should do or not. Uh, I truly, I, I disagree. I'm sorry, Councillor Dean. I also think that something could certainly be done that might appease both sides. But I think the law enforcement probably feels their hands are tied due to the fact that the jails are overcrowded. 85% of the people are waiting for sentencing. So where do we stand on <clears throat> county commission, a new jail or some sort of interim? If we do crack down, where do we put these people? We have nowhere for them to go. So I think that has to be addressed before we can actually put anything into place. <laughs> And I will say some of that is, you know, if there's part of this is about 
what I've also heard is creating more accountability. And that, you know, if an individual, if an individual is unhoused and is part of the community, I think it's the behaviors, those that are engaging in behaviors that are dangerous or illegal to others. I think that's where the issue is. The fact that an individual is unhoused isn't it isn't a crime, is nothing we would ever go and pursue. But if you're engaging only in illegal back, back activities, if you're making it unsafe for others, if you're creating a public disturbance, I think we need to do something. And that could be a citation. If we can't get them into jail, maybe it's another citation. But we have to do something that's accountability other than here's a connection. If somebody, if we handed somebody and said, hey, look, here's an opportunity, here are some resources we can connect you with. If they're agreeable, that's great. But if there's no commitment to being more accountable as a person in our community, I still think that the, regardless if there's space in the jail, I still think it needs to. From what I'm hearing, there's a desire to escalate the approach. Councilor Leonard and then Councilor Fish. I would uh, definitely caution um, doing something akin to like a knee jerk reaction to uh, what we're seeing right now. I think if we are to amend any of our policies, they should be done with a uh, plan that's well thought out in process to the situation that we have. We can't keep overburdening the judicial system with more and more cases. Uh, the it, It's getting unsustainable. You're having people going to jail that it's it's for some 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 of them their first offense they have to spend uh the night in jail uh for to, something akin to like five hours of sleep with no lights on and we expect these people to be ready to go to court the next day uh because of the backlog of people they're trying to get into uh to, to have their first hearing in some cases there are some uh, uh people that are in jail that uh, because they've been waiting so long to hear their case, their uh, bail has actually been reduced. Some of these uh, individuals are uh, people that should not be uh, on reduced bail, but because they are actually violent criminals. And I would hesitate to increase the number of casework that are uh, defense attorneys and prosecutors have to deal with that are from uh, uh, nonviolent uh, uh, offenses in the city. So whatever we decide to do as a council, I would caution anything that's reactionary and have it be a comprehensive approach. We all know that you're not going to be able to get clean from drugs if you are out on the streets. You need to have some sort of sustainable living area in order to uh, uh overcome one's addiction so i i think going this approach of being more enforcing i would be happy to hear what uh what the police department the uh, uh police chief and the deputy to hear what they have to say I, that their words would be very impactful at the same time i think it's also important to remind ourselves that we have subject matter experts that have a lot of years of experience in this field that know what right looks like. And I don't want to repeat the mistakes of other municipalities in the country that have been doing the right thing, but then uh, they revert course and then go back to doing some sort of model of uh, a drug enforcement that actually has of more negative impacts than positive impacts. That's what I want to avoid at the end of the day. Councilor Fish and then Councilor Schaefer. Um, a, I don't think it's a knee jerk reaction. I think that gradually over even pre COVID, we were hearing uh, some grumblings from our community. Um, I saw it myself owning a company and owning <clears throat> a commercial building. I saw it gradually over the last 10 or 15 years. And I'm not advocating that we, you know, tell the police to be the Gestapo and be out there and be very enforceful. I'm saying I think we should support them. And I would like to also hear from Chief Pathway to see how we can change things 
And, and I don't think we need more research and, and take another year or two or three or four or five for other experts. We're the experts. We live and we work and we play. We have family. We know our police department. We know our people. We're the experts. We are the ones that should be making the decisions. And we should be the ones to not be too afraid to make decisions now. And, and in a support, and, and again, in collaboration and with our experts, you know, the chief, I'd like to see what the chief has to say to help give us some advice uh, to help how we can help them. Councilor Schaefer. Um, so this sort of reminds me of parking tickets. And I know that like <laughs> pre-COVID, we had done this thing, we were gonna do the, um, well, but we're gonna do the boot that if you were a scoff law and you had, Yep. dozens of unpaid parking tickets because there's a lot of people that do mm -hmm. they were finally going to lock down your car and you'd have to call mm -hmm. him all off to be able to move your car from its spot and then we switched to a barnacle has it ever been deployed uh i think it was for a brief period of time but it's coming back okay so different, a different solution is coming and and so so i bring up that example because great we we've become more um we start making more arrests we start issuing more citations but there's no place for them. So we're adding to the court cases. It's like what, when, when you don't, I mean, I see both sides of it. When you don't throw a barnacle on someone's windshield, Correct. why would you, why, why would, would you, you change? Why would you comply? When you don't get cited for not plowing your sidewalks, why would you start plowing your sidewalks when you don't do this? So there's lots of areas where we could do better enforcement. This one, I get it. I just told you, my kids don't feel safe walking down the street to the library anymore. And I hate that for my family. But okay, so we arrest people. Okay, so now you're arrested. So where are you going to go? We can't go to jail because there's too much room. And the, you know, we, we need mm -hmm. to make room for violent offenders in our jail. I prefer, we prefer to have violent offenders in our jail than property crime committers, wherever that is. Um, but then the person who's gotten a citation now has a stack of citations that will probably never see a court case or will take years to become a court case. And you can't put a barnacle on a person like you can a car for parking tickets. So I, I, I so I, I understand that people are frustrated with this situation. I would, I see the NLC manager updates around here. I would bet that at NLC, you guys heard that we are not unique and having issues with figuring out how to manage the unhoused population and things like that. I have no idea what the answer is, but both paths seem equally impactful, which is to say <laughs> not very. And so I, I don't know what the answer is. I would love to support, you know, if, if PD has some ideas that they think would be impactful, that's great. But I feel like at the end, you're just handing citations that are not gonna have much of an impact so I, I I just don't know. I don't know what the answer is. And so I want to be on record saying, I don't know. Councilor <laughs> Fournier. Um, thank you. I think there is a need for a change. Um, and I think we do need to step it up. Um, it, Bangor Police does a great job. They're very compassionate um, with whomever they're dealing with. And I, I think that speaks volumes. But um, I, and I do like the idea of creating some accountability um, for the individuals that they need to, again, step it up um, so that there aren't these reputed offenses um, and hopefully to change the direction of where they're going. And I, there is a, a need for a change. I wouldn't say aggressive. I don't. I didn't like the word no, aggressive. That was my word. Okay. Um, that would never. Be. <laughs> it was me. It was me. But we need to definitely step it up. We've invoked the police chief's name multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> if you're prepared to speak, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're welcome. It's like Beetlejuice. <laughs> <laughs> we did say it multiple times, so I guess that's why the appeal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I still think that we have been supportive of the police department, and maybe you can speak to that, Chief Hathaway. Uh, when we provided the funding for VCAT, I thought that was a huge support for the police department because they did not have to respond to the calls that did not, you know, necessitate uh, action. It was okay. so. 
I mean, personally thinking, you know, we have been supportive all the way. And if they came to us with a suggestion that this needs to be done, we would have been there supporting them as well. Just one time to come. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know that we have a suggestion. I mean, we are certainly, and the city manager touched on this, every municipal police department is or should be a reflection of the community. Communities needs change, and the police department needs to change with those with those adjustments. If there is indeed an adjustment in 2022, it would appear that we our community was much different than it is now, and it appears that there's a different posture on this issue. If that is indeed true, then your police department will adjust as necessary. Uh, we just need a little clarity on this issue, but we are certainly prepared to make changes. I think listening to what you said and what people have said, I mean, obviously I think everybody's in agreement that we can't, we can't we're not going to rest our way yeah. out of the situation. So what, what's the, what's the meet, what's the, where we meet when we say what's working with, you know, we supported what we were doing now, but we're saying let's be, you know, let's see a different direction. But we know we can't arrest everybody. There's not room. That's not what we want to do. Anyway. No, no. We want to get people to where they need to be, Correct. which isn't where they are now. So uh, how do we get do we... Well, it's, it's important to know, and I, I understand, I truly understand the frustration of our residents and our business mm -hmm. owners. Uh, the, a pol the street police officer, we have really set that that person up for failure. We don't provide the street police officer that was in, with resources to solve the problem. Uh, there, there's limited mental health options, right? L limited jail space. Uh, the courts are are uh, overburdened. So the police officer on the street has very few options how to solve a problem in the moment. And remember, the police are not a long-term solution to any issue. We are really just a temporary solution to the immediate problem. So an individual is engaged in some sort of bad behavior, the police officer arrives and has to determine what the best course of action is. Currently, in some instances, the best course of action, at least for the past couple of years since this policy was in, uh, put in place, is to provide resource, outreach, and connections to services. I sense that that might be changing uh, based on this conversation. We can still provide those services, but we can also charge individual individuals with criminal behavior if they're engaged in such. Uh, currently, we might not be doing that as often as we certainly can. And if that is the, the desire, we can certainly explore that and, and do that as well. Um, but there is no simple solution to this. And when I when I think about uh, uh, being a police officer, a young police officer, uh, when I was, we didn't have these challenges that we currently have. And I, I do wish that I could give the police officer in the street all the tools he or she needs to fix a problem. But we don't have that in place. We just simply do not. So we have to try to find solutions right now in the moment to try to solve the issue. And when when we pull away from the situation and the business owner says, well, they're the police, they didn't do it. They didn't arrest the person. They did nothing again. I'm irritated with them. Well, we might not have a situation where we can place that person in jail. Their behavior might be such that it didn't, it didn't uh, require an arrest and we are unable to find a suitable placement for them for mental health treatment. The hospital is not the right location. We don't have a lot of, a lot of options. So we're always trying to find the right balance always, always trying to find the right balance between the individual that's in crisis and the business owner and the resident. And I'm not sure that we're we're finding the right balance at this point based on this conversation, but I promise you, it is not for the lack of trying. And I, and I know that. And I think I just want to, hopefully when you leave the meeting tonight, you know that you've got the support of the council and that uh, we want to give you the resources you need and uh, it bothers me and, off you know. like when Councilor Schaefer makes reference to her daughter's not feeling safe downtown and this wouldn't be the first time I've heard this unfortunately and I really I, I truly understand that and it does bother us a great deal when we hear those stories one of the things that we're lacking right now is a presence a, a consistent presence in some areas and we just it I, it's it's a broken record and not, nobody in this room and nobody on uh, on the television wants to hear this as an excuse over and over and over so I, I caution I'm not trying to use an excuse it's just a Product of where we are, it is a staffing issue. If we were fully staffed, I promise you, we would have a much more robust presence downtown daily. And we are trying to figure a way to do it with per diem officers, retirees, part time. We're trying to find a solution to the downtown issue. It's not for the lack of discussion. I promise you, we discuss this all the time. It really is uh, an issue of of people. We just don't have enough people to to meet everybody's needs. And and once when we do. 
And I truly feel confident that we are moving in the direction where we are going to start to hire people. We have some good prospects that we're looking at. Then we will be able to improve our presence downtown. And this issue that we're talking about tonight will improve with just police presence. We may never have to charge a person with a crime. We just have to be more present. Good behavior uh, pushes out bad behavior. Pastor Schaefer? Uh, I just wanted to um, add that, like, one of the, you know, I, I wouldn't want... I wouldn't want any any of our city officials, whether it's PD, whether it's public health, whether it's public, anyone, to stop offering. Hey, even if it's yeah. a card, if they take the card and throw it away ten times, maybe the eleventh sure. time they'd actually read it. You know, I wouldn't want to move away from that. I think one of the things we had public comment well, a while ago now at, at back in the old chambers of the situation of the house for sale and people that were squatting in the yard and were told, oh, you have twenty four hours. And I think that anyone listening to that. I know I said afterwards, I'm like, that can't be right. And it wasn't, it was like a misunderstanding between uh, PD and and whoever the whole situation. So things, I, I think things like that need to be, that's why I'm saying it out loud, clear that that is not something that somebody is squatting on your backyard. You do not have to give them a 24 hour notice. They, you can call the PD and they should be able to take care of that, right? To Absolutely. move someone off of your yard. Yes. Things like that, I that and the little card that went around was, alarming because it showed like somebody breaking a window and going into your house and saying hey this is totally fine you won't get arrested if you do this not the right approach from that organization um so i you know i i feel like if somebody's being cited it should be for a good not a good cause but for cause and to make sure that people know that you know you don't need a 24-hour notice to have somebody to leave your premises things like that um but I, I would not want to say, well, we're not going to offer any suggestions of services. I want to keep doing that regardless of what I do any there. Well, one thing I appreciate tonight is the comments about the compassion our officers have displayed. I must tell you, uh, it is amazing the level of, of compassion and understanding that our officers have demonstrated over the last several years while dealing with this issue. And, and um not that we would uh, step away from that at, uh, for certain, but if we can be uh, a little more uh, direct with some of our responses, and if that's the most appropriate uh, way to handle this issue, then we most certainly will. I do firmly believe that an increased presence uh, will help solve this issue, and that is directly related to staffing. And I'm pretty confident that we're going to move in the right direction with staffing. Oh, can I follow up on that? And that, that's the other thing. I would really, like, even if it was... Um, even if there was sort of a, a downtown officer for a few weeks or just if we I, don't have a body, I, I, I wish that we don't have a body. Yeah. Yes. And that's, and so I know staffing is an issue, but I we used to have a downtown officer. I think that'd be a wonderful position to get rebuilt. We had a staff meeting this past Thursday and it was, a, it was an agenda item. How do we create the downtown walking officer again? How do we do it? Mm -hmm. Can we get to that point? Uh, is there something we can do without currently to make that happen? We're always looking for ways to shift manpower, shift staffing. And, and this is a topic of discussion. Will it happen before summer? I don't know. Would we like it to? Absolutely. Yes. But that, that's something that I would, I just want to be on record is that I would support mm -hmm. just an increase because I, I do, I feel the same way. That's why I was so excited about the um, the renovation of Pickering Square, because you make it a place that people want to be doing good things. People who are doing bad things will not be there as much. So thank you. Councilor Dean and then Councilor Fish. But my question was basically what we just discussed, but what is your presence now? So now it's as needed. There's a patrol car assigned to downtown. What, what we had at one time was an officer dedicated on foot that okay. walked on foot downtown. So ideally and, that would be what we... Oh my gosh, yes. Have. If we could do that again, that would one, be... One yes. officer downtown? It would be fantastic, day. yes. It... it at some point, we'll have this. We'll have the and staffing to accomplish it. Issue. It's more just a matter of trying to find that person. We That's don't correct. have adequate staff to actually staff most days our regular patrol routes. <clears throat> and are that those is the are those routes more important than our downtown? If yeah, well, they are. We we divide yeah, the yeah. city up into six zones. We need to fill those six zones so they can be to respond to calls. Mm -hmm. The downtown assignment would be a seventh zone. Can we accomplish it in, in time? I think we can. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chief Hathaway, I know that you know I have a soft spot for the PD, so I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't trying to like blame you guys, as you know. Yes. But I was just expressing what I've been hearing. It's been a tough couple of weeks. So um 
So I do appreciate, and I have to tell you how impressed I was to ride around with your uh, community outreach officer and um, spent quite a bit of time with her that day and to see what um, your staff has been trained to do and how compassionate they are and how skilled they really are and, and the relationship and liaison that they have with other uh, services to be able to connect these people. I was, um, I was pretty impressed with that. And um, so I, I think it's just wanting to know how we can help the department. I think uh, somehow I've gotten the impression and I think a lot of people have somehow with this protocol, your hands have been somewhat tied. And I know it, it's a mandate from state, but there's other complex issues also playing into that. And I wanted to know, um, do you, I know downtown came to us a few weeks ago about Streetwise or some type of downtown project that they're um, hoping to get some funding for. And um, they've come in a couple of times asking for that. And that would be a private thing with the, the downtown businesses, but maybe there's something in collaboration. I do think we need an officer down there, but would uh, the department be receptive in, in working at looking at those types of uh, ideas and working in collaboration? We, yes, absolutely. Where you're short, where you're short staff, maybe we could take that idea and build on that, or think a little outside the box. Oh, for sure. I think any any time we have ambassadors or somebody downtown that's keeping a watch over things, for sure, we would support that. Yes, mm -hmm. and I think a program like that might work very well with uh, a downtown walking assignment, okay. and I, I can see that working in 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 uh, partnership very well. Okay. And what could we do immediately that you think could help help your department? This conversation. This, this has been helpful. Um, I've talked with the city solicitor and, uh, you know, we can uh, provide officers with some uh, clarity with regard to the protocol, uh, number of responses, repeated behavior, whether or not the actions are detrimental to public order, things of that nature that we can provide officers greater clarity so they have a better understanding of uh, maybe what we hope they can achieve. They may not have the resources to achieve it, and I realize the frustration. And it's not the business owner's fault, uh, responsibility, or the resident's responsibility to determine solutions. It is ours, and we will continue to try to find those solutions. But they're not always there; they just don't always exist. But it is incumbent on us to try to find those, and we'll continue yeah. to work at that. So, even though the the I know we don't have the judicial system, the court system, and the jails don't have the capacity to handle a lot of arrests. Do you think just engaging with these individuals to tell them this behavior is unacceptable? Maybe just a little more interaction might give them the idea it's not yes. necessarily so, tolerable. Yes, that's the that's the idea of increased behavior. presence. Increased presence yeah. for sure. Increased. I mean, literally, we've we've done this in uh, in in other areas of the city, city parks, and so forth, where good behavior does indeed uh, drive out bad behavior. And an increased presence, whether it be ambassadors from a program, a private program, or whether it be police officers, will indeed in improve this issue. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Last question, and then we'll move on. I think I remember Bar Harbor used to have like security, not necessarily police officers, but did they not have security? Well, I know I knew they have a walking they have an, a walking assignment downtown in the summer. I do know that. I don't know about security. Is that a do possibility, have a... or do you think that it needs to be a police presence? Would security officers work? Well, I think that's a that's akin to what um, uh, we're talking about here with this ambassador program. Yeah, I don't know if they have that capacity though. I think, I, I think it probably takes more conversation. I think yeah. in a perfect world, if we could align the two programs together, that would work. Thank you. Thank you. Good. All right. We'll invite the city solicitor up to the hot seat. Oh, yeah. Let me get out. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so I wanted to give you a solicitor's update. Just uh, I can't possibly talk about all the things that we work on in our department, but I will tell you that we we are working on both of the issues that you've uh, already discussed tonight, and we will continue to to work if um, if there need to be changes to the protocol that the police department has that we stand ready to make changes if um, Chief Hathaway thinks that that would be helpful. Um, the protocol could could be tweaked. Uh, it has to follow the compliance with the statute, 
but it doesn't have to be exactly uh, the same as the attorney general's model protocol. And if there could be some changes that uh, that the police feel is helpful, we stand ready to, to make those changes and, and provide guidance and whatever is needed in that regard. Um, there are, um, one of the things that we've been doing in the legal department is um, uh, working on the vacant building protocol and uh, with the, you know, working with the other departments as a team to try to uh, ultimately uh, help re reduce the number of vacant buildings in the city that, and uh, with the goal of, you know, uh, providing uh, more housing. Um, and I wanted to just let you know that we have, um, we have been working as a team with the Community and Economic Development Department and, and the Code Enforcement Office and um, and others to to make to update all the contacts with the vacant property owners so that the notices sent to them will be more effective. Uh, we have finalized workflow protocols and templates for different classifications of vac vacant properties. Um, uh, properties that are uh, in the protocol have all been sent at least first notices of the unregistered properties. Um, so they're in the protocol. Um, and we are working on from the start to the finish when the property becomes uh, hopefully not vacant anymore. Uh, and that would include the, the policy um, that we are updating. We're working to revise the policy for the disposal of tax acquired properties uh, to make it comply with the new state statute, uh, which recognizes certain rights of former property owners. Um, this is likely an ongoing process because there's a working group making recommendations and, and, and many of you have heard of, the, of we talked about this at a recent committee meeting. Um, they're making recommendations to the legislature that we anticipate will be dealt with uh, by the legislature later this year. So it's somewhat of a moving target, but we are uh, working on that policy uh, to make it comply with the new statute and we'll continue to do so when the statute probably ends up getting changed significantly, uh, not that much later this year. Um, if any of you have any questions on the vacant building protocol and our work in that regard, I'd be glad to field any, or any questions on any of the work that the legal department's been doing. Um, as you know, we've, we've, uh, there's, uh, our, the legal department uh, provides guidance to the planning board uh, at each meeting and, and beyond that. Uh, the, I think I let you know last time that the Lancaster Avenue project, which involved, which is the project where there was a, a development that would result in a, a pretty good deal of housing. Uh, there's been no appeal of that decision and the appeal time is over with. So uh, that uh, that is good news. Um, we've helped the planning division to uh, and the planning board to revise the process so that voting separately on each requirement uh, is done and uh, revise the form of the written decision to protect in the future against um, the scrutiny of courts should any of the decisions you know, be appealed. Um, the legal department is the staff liaison to the Board of Appeals, uh, which means that we take care of the scheduling, uh, getting a quorum, uh, all notices that go to appropriate people, including abutters and such, and publishing in the newspaper and uh, legal guidance is provided uh, at the Board of Appeals meetings, including hearings. Uh, we also draft the decisions that are made by the board. Um, we are putting in a proposed change to the Board of Appeals Ordinance, which uh, you will see a, a small change that will uh, make the process more efficient because the, uh, it, we would propose a, a, a change to make the chair have authority to grant a continuance if the applicant asks for it um, without having to convene the entire board to do so. Um, We've had multiple occasions since I've been here where the applicant has filed an appeal because they they have to within a certain period of time. Uh, they wanted to preserve their ability to do so, but they wanted and needed a continuance to hopefully resolve the violation without the boards having to hear the matter. We've had to com 
we had to convene the board each time to grant the continuance. And so the change that we're proposing would allow the chair to do so. And I think it would uh, be good for everybody. Uh, oftentimes when these continuances are granted, the matter doesn't end up coming before the board because the violation or whatever it is is resolved. Uh, and, then, and then there's no hearing at all. So uh, that I think that'll be a, a good, easy change to make. Um, We've had a number of, of appeals to the board of appeals since I've been here. Uh, I I understand a good deal more than occurred in the in the years before prior to my arrival. I don't know if that has something to do with coming out of COVID or or whatever, but there have been a number of uh, those matters. We're always working on a num any number of contracts, uh, responding to Freedom of Access Act requests, um, and that involves pretty much any and all of the departments in the city. Um, we're always doing quick claim deeds for transfer of property back to landowners who have paid their taxes, sewer and stormwater bills. Um, uh, and a myriad of issues are brought to our part, our department from various city departments, needing legal advice, guidance, drafting and input. And um, that is uh, ongoing. We are fully staffed as you know now with three individuals. Uh, everyone is doing very well, in my opinion. Um, you know, we, we've assisted many departments to negotiate, draft and finalize and execute a myriad of contracts recently, including stuff like solar array, decommissioning bond forms, declaration of environmental covenants, uh, website licensing agreements, community connector contracts, and, um, I'm not going to go into a whole long list of that sort of thing, but um, I already mentioned that we're working to revise the, the um, disposal of tax acquired property. Uh, we also have provided training since the last time I updated you on, uh, uh, on Freedom of Access Act and ethics training, that sort of thing to the Board of Assessment Review, the Advisory Committee, on racial equity, inclusion, and human rights, the planning board and the historic preservation commission. Those have been some of the recent trains we've done. Um, I did want to uh, update you on a recent Supreme Court case, a U.S. Supreme Court case on um, officials' use of social media. It's very timely. The decision came down March fifteenth. I would like to take credit for um, <laughs> for updating you, but it really. Uh, came to me through Debbie. So um, it was a case uh, named Linky versus Freed. Uh, and the reason why I just wanted to bring it up and update you is it involved uh, a city official in Michigan uh, using Facebook uh, at first for personal Facebook use before the person became the city manager. And then after that, the post began to also include things that related to uh, stuff that was going on in the city. And um, uh, as you might guess, there was uh, the person, the other person named Freed, uh, he began posting on this uh, Linky's Facebook wall saying how abysmal the city had responded to COVID and making disparaging remarks about the city and certain officials that worked there. Uh, when Linky uh, deleted those posts and later ultimately blocked Freed from posting on the Facebook account, uh, Freed sued Linky and the city saying that Linky's Facebook page was a public forum and that Linky uh, acting under color of governmental authority violated his free speech rights. So I just wanted to let you know that, that that's what happened in that case. The Supreme Court's decision was favorable from the city's perspective in that it said in order to uh, prevail against uh, the city, they had to show that the person had actual authority and also was uh, uh, using that authority to uh, to make uh, public uh, to make the public forum from the city. Mm -hmm. So it was a decision that was favorable to the city, but it was noted in the decision that it is important and it becomes a very tricky issue when you are mixing social media use for personal use and 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 public sort of uh, 
things as well. And so in looking at my first glance of this decision, or my first review of it, I don't see anything in our ordinances that would need to be changed. I think that the ordinances go a, a ways to try to make sure that that uh, city councilors, for example, uh, indicate on their social media accounts that this is a this is personal account and these are my personal views and uh, and under the the case that that just came down that would be a, a rebuttable presumption in favor of it not being governmental action and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to update you on that. Does anybody have any questions about anything uh, that we do? Councilor Fournier? Without getting into details, but how are our friends on Columbia Street working it out? <laughs> um, we we have progress on that. And um, uh, the it's a complicated matter. <laughs> Um, and we anticipate that there will be um, work undertaken to repair the situation. Right. And if it isn't, then we we have in place um, the action needed to ensure that uh, it gets done. That it gets done. Yeah. Good. Uh, and yeah, that's as much as I. <laughs> Other questions. Mine's about the vacant properties. Do we have a number of how many that we're currently working through? Yeah, that is um, always a tricky thing because, I mean, I can tell you that right now we have uh, 41 properties currently on the list, but that is, I don't want you to get too excited about that because it's an, another reduction from last time. Mm -hmm. But part of what we're doing with the protocol is to make sure that properties get onto the list in an expedient and efficient way. So in our in um, uh, doing what we do, if we're doing it right, that's, that list is gonna be added to. And so I don't want you to get um, unduly optimistic, but that's what it, it's 41 properties on the list now. Uh, 15 of those are registered and current and a 16th attempted to register and pay the correct amount, but didn't pay the incorrect amount. So, um, that's that's you know those numbers have, have come down. Uh, there are four, four of them that are currently owned by the city, so we're in the process of doing what we need to do to um, uh, make that those properties not vacant anymore. And so, uh, just currently a snapshot today, twenty one are unregistered and not up to date. But again, those numbers are going to change, and they may change going up as a result of our being efficient and more efficient and getting properties onto the list. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Right, Appreciate thank you. the update. Moving on to the Parks and Rec Feasibility Study discussion. Oh, there he is. Parks and Rec. <laughs> Parks and Rec was patrolling the hall. I saw <laughs> I don't know if I dare sit in this chair when he's doing space listener and police chief have occupied. I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Yeah. So, I, uh, as you uh, see in your summary tonight and up for adoption at your meeting tonight, uh, is the final product of our draft report of our feasibility study for the Parks and Rec Center and Soy Arena. Um, here this afternoon, this evening, to is there any further uh, discussion, thoughts, questions uh, before that, before tonight's meeting? Councilor Trumbull. No, I mean, we were presented with this a while ago. I think they did what we asked them to do. Yep. The only thing they didn't do was come forward with a blank check. So everything. <laughs> I, mean, I haven't seen that yet. I don't recall that in the contract. Yeah. <laughs> so unless they, unless they do that, we'll be all set. <laughs> Thank you. So the only thing I didn't see was the capital improvements that are going to be needed to keep Sawyer operational. You will see that. I will see that. You will see okay, that. Uh, so to that question, we have our budget process coming coming forward to you, and there'll be an item and some items in that that we'll want to discuss with you specific right. to Sawyer and the needs in the short term over there. Short term and long term. 
All right. For the next, yes, yes. Yep. All right. Great. Thanks. And, and the new boards have already gotten this way, right? Mm -hmm. The new dashers are, and I always, I lose track of a couple of years ago, it ends up being five, six, but yes, the new dashers were. Huh? Well, the supports that we right, did. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. The supports we did for them that Looking we did over this past year, summer. Right? Yep, yeah, yep, yep, summer. yep. Is there questions on the study? Uh, no questions. It was a good job. I, I thought it uh, came out very well. Thank you. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the support of the council throughout the process and certainly as we wrap up the first, first step tonight. Right, easy. See, not so scary. Oh God! <laughs> Go ahead. Everybody's oh, jealous. <laughs> Everybody's jealous. Thank you. Parks and Rec is fun. <laughs> we tried. It. We tried. It. Thank you. Okay. Um, next on the agenda: a summary of NLC Congressional City Conference. It's just an opportunity for the counselors who went to uh, share a little bit about their experience. Councilor Fish, can I take on me first? Um, <laughs> It was um, it was a great experience. Um, I met a lot of people from a lot of other municipalities, our size, smaller, bigger, and uh, it was interesting to hear what um, their issues with their city were. And um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, ours were very similar. And some actually, you know, when I mentioned substance abuse, mental illness, and, and homelessness. They, some of them, you know, I'd say about 40% didn't have that. They had other issues as far as trying to keep their, you know, bigger retail companies there and, and having employees. So they, they had, you know, their issues, but um, learned a lot about funding and um, federal grants and federal processes. And uh, it was, uh, it was a lot to take in. But it was a great experience, and I'm glad I went. And I came away with some contacts uh, and a lot of reading material, and a lot more to read. But it was it was great, and um, I'm I'm grateful for the city to uh, have afforded me the opportunity. Councilor Tremble. Yeah, I would just agree. I mean, a lot of the sessions that were breakout sessions afterwards, we could have small group discussions with other people from across the country. The thing that really struck me is, that especially when you looked at housing, what we're doing in Bangor housing, and we're doing all the right things. We're doing, we're really leading the way in what we're doing, helping people with infrastructure, doing the, the loans that we've done. I mean, everything we're doing is best practices in housing and in the homeless uh, house population. And we're doing the right things. I think it's it's going to, we're going to get some traction soon. But uh, when you talk to other people around the country, we're, we're really, doing what people are doing around the country. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think last year, for sure, when I went, the, the most important thing was getting to understand how the federal government works in terms of grants you can apply for as a community and what the money will go to and how that process works. I think we'll, when we get a grant writer on board. Started last Monday. <clears throat> when our new grant writer is up to speed, then we will... <laughs> You know, we'll, we'll be well positioned to take advantage of those funds. There's still lots of millions and millions of dollars out there for things like infrastructure and housing that we can be taking advantage of. So hopefully we'll make some some progress there. But one of the other things that I think is so valuable about that experience is getting to meet the other city councilors from across the state of Maine um, to talk with them about what's happening in their communities. We we're very pleased to have Brewer there. Um, Portland, South Portland, all had folks there. There was a gentleman from Lewiston there as well. Hamden. And Hamden, that's right. Thank you. Um, to, what you learn is that the your city is unique, but the problems that you're facing are not. Um, and it's, it is nice to hear from others who are, are trying to move the same needle and walk the same path that we are. So it was a, a very positive experience. And Hill Day was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, getting We were able to meet with both uh, Senator Collins and Senator King, um, and both uh, Congressman Golden and Congresswoman Pingree, um, to talk about the issues that matter to Maine in general and Bangor in specific. Questions about the NLC? Okay, manager updates. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to circle back. So, um, Following the um, um, 
Councillor Gakabag and I actually attended a forum at the University of Maine Augusta with the Chancellor, the Dean, and all of the students. Um, a week later, uh, Chief Hathaway, Council Chair Pelletier and I also may, met with the, cha the Chancellor and the Dean, um, discussed their concerns, and discussed ideas about how to support the safety of the students as well as those within the encampment. Um, the university shared a significant number of additional steps that they have taken, and they were pleased to hear um, this kind of rolls into the next item, but we are doing a uh, another uh, cleanup within the encampment um, later this week. So they were pleased to hear that. We continue to remain in contact with one another. I got, a, I got an email from Dean Sector today. Um, so we continue to have those conversations. Obviously we, can, we remain committed to participating with them in any way we can to offer assistance. And Councilor Yakabagi, you referenced a concern. Um, so the intersection of Texas and University where the syringe service uh, program was approved, um, that is not city property. That property belongs to the University of Maine Augusta. Oh. So we did make the University of Maine oh, yeah. Augusta aware of that when we met with them. Um, I touched on it a little bit that um, we are, uh, we've been working with outreach on individuals with the encampment to undertake another abbreviated cleanup. Um, we were having, when we planned this day, we were having milder weather. We were concerned about mud a little bit. So we had identified some areas sort of more uh, adjacent to the road. Um, those um, sites still remain. Um, individuals were participating in that. Um, so that is set for Wednesday. We put signs in place, outreach workers and work to make sure individuals knew that that was an opportunity. We also have a couple of um, campers that we feel are abandoned, and that abandonment is based on feedback from the outreach. So we're going to be posting those as abandoned property as required under state statute. Uh, we are anxiously awaiting final legislative actions in Augusta um, that may have an impact on our community, uh, specifically funding and uh, general assistance and shelters. Uh, I also got earlier today. I got a link that has all of the congressionally directed spending requests that were approved as part of the 2024 budget. So I just wanted to take a second to read through um, some of those that are of significance for our region. There was a $5 million education to the Bangor region wide to provide housing and healthcare services. So that's in support of their, their new facility. A million dollars to Northern Lake uh, Home Care and Hospice to expand telehealth. $1.9 million to Life Flight of Maine to purchase ground critical care vehicles, $467,000 to Wellspring for the expansion of substance use disorder treatment beds, $366,000 to Bangor Nursing and Rehab Center to renovate critical space to increase safety, $704,000 to Maine Air National Guard for repair of whiskey apron, uh, just under a million dollars to the universe, uh, to Hassan University to purchase new equipment for STEM fields. Uh, just about $1.1 million to Northern Lake uh, to support cancer patients. $370,000 to Heart of Maine United Way to expand early childhood intervention. $1.5 million to St. Joseph's Healthcare to repair and modernize the ER department. $270,000 to Eastern Area Agency on Aging to develop additional access points. $1.2 million to Wabanaki Public Health to create community spaces for Wabanaki culture. $300,000 to the City of Bangor for the Site Feasibility Analysis of Maine Science Park. Uh, $1.4 million to Maine International Guard to repair mm -hmm. and hangar access apron. $239,000 to Penobscot Theater Company support improvement and upkeep of the Bangor Opera House. Uh, $100,000 to the Bangor Historical Society uh, for the Thomas Hill House Portico restoration. And just under $2.2 million to the, General, to the Challenger Learning Center of Maine for space and edu mission education simulators. Now I'm gonna come back and talk about University of Maine. There were a number of University of Maine initiatives many of which obviously will have an impact on us. 3.3 million for their Rural Educator Resilience Project, uh, just over 3 million to develop a PhD program in the School of Nursing, 
four million dollars to build a child care facility. Uh, four million dollars uh, for Biohome 3D, scaling up the technology to address critical affordable housing shortage in Maine. Uh, Ten million dollars for a forest biomaterials innovation center, sustainable packaging institute. Five million dollars for an environmental analytical laboratory modernization and expansion. So all of those are are good for our future. So I wanted to share those. Also wanted to remind folks that this is the week of additional, we're, we're doing a lot of public meetings this week. So um, we have put out notice that we are doing our, we're kicking off our public forum on public bathrooms this week. So Wednesday night, it will be at the Fairmount School on 13th Street. Um, Thursday night, it will be at the Cohen School on Garland Street. And Friday is our inaugural coffee with the council at the library atrium. So a lot of things going on this week. And that's it. There's one more thing that, I'm oh, sorry, any questions or comments for the city manager? Okay, the, the last thing is an email I sent to you all. When we were at NLC, I was informed by the mayor of South Portland, that there is a Maine Mayor's Council Consortium Coalition. Ma coalition. Mayor's Coalition. Thank you. I knew it was a C word. Um, where the mayors of different cities in Maine get together. Uh, I believe they actually use the dues to hire lobbyists to go and talk about specific um, issues in Augusta. And there's interest for the city of Bangor to participate in that. Um, it's something that uh, I wanted to bring to all of you because if I were to attend this year, it would be on your behalf. And so um, we would also need, I think the dues, the dues are minimal. It's like yeah. $3,000. It's not very much. But I do think, you know, one of the themes that, that uh, Councillor Leonard has been talking about is creating um, cooperative relationships with other departments and, and legislators and, and um, municipal um, councils throughout the state. I think this is a really good opportunity. And if we decide to stay in, of course, whoever becomes mayor in November would have the opportunity to participate as well. So I wanted to bring that to you for um, your vote and see if you want me to pursue that. If not, we can talk about it again in November when whoever the new person is. My yeah. only comment is I know we were part of it before and and I think it was when Nichols, Councillor Nichols, or maybe it was Davitt, Somebody at one point said why, that Bangor was not getting any benefit, that it was really focused on, maybe it was focused on Southern Maine. I don't think there was something that made us, we were part of it and made us back out of it. And I don't know what that is. So that <laughs> is my only hesitation. If it is going to provide us value now that it didn't provide then, but I would check back into some of the institutional history on our, on our maybe already have, but with our work with that group, that's all. Okay. And I, so Bangor was one of the inaugural members of the mayor's mm -hmm. coalition back along. So we were actually one of the founding members. So we we were in it for quite a while and I, I couldn't figure out why we had left. So that was helpful. I will share with you that there was a period of time that we left Maine Municipal Association mm -hmm. because Maine Municipal Association was not viewed as advocating for um topics and positions that the city felt was important. So we're back. We're back in both. So I, I think we can reach out to the two counselors specifically that you talked to and see if we can figure out. I can't was it? Yeah. It, yeah, I was I was asked. I passed on it. It just seemed to be much more political. Um and I, that wasn't an area I wanted to go down. Maybe it's changed. I know the head, um, or the previous head, I think he had been chair for a number of years. Uh, may have been a yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, my two cents on that. Anything else for the good of the body? All right. Yes, Councilor Lennon. Did you want to make a motion on that now, or did you want that just as an initial discussion at this point? Yeah, I think it might make sense to do a little research on it. I can always bring it back sure to the Council for further uh, discussion and potential action. Councilor Trumbo? I was just saying, I would be supportive of, uh, you know, depending on what you find out. But I think it's a different make a composition of the group now, and I think it would, I don't think it would hurt to 
it's a minimal investment for the city. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we could try it. If you, you know, the EA, you say, well, it really wasn't worth it. We don't need to re-up. Okay. Let me do a little digging yeah. and we'll talk about it. Yeah. Great.